And we are alive. I will mute everybody because I neglected to do that in the beginning. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the November 20th edition of TGI, the greatest indoor reading series. We are here, uh, Trina and I coming to you from Queens, New York, as is one of the readers tonight, I believe. Um, uh, and weirdly, many people who are involved in the show, it turns out, were either born in Queens or lived in Queens for some part of their life, which is great because it's better than Brooklyn. At any rate, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ridge Cresswell. I am a audiobook narrator, uh, audio person, and general um, artsy weirdo uh, who lives here in Queens. Uh, and we have been doing this um, program since uh, about March uh, when my better half or uh, adjusting for size percentages, better two th or better third, uh, Trina Thibodeau um, felt a lack of the usual community um, that we used to get from things like readings, from things like residencies, from things like conferences, um, sort of the, all those things you do when you pursue an artistic pursuit, um, which of course, most of them by nature are relatively solitary, all those things you do to connect to others and to share what you do. Um, so we have taken it virtual and um, I think it's gone pretty well. I'm no, I don't know. You guys can be the judge, I guess. Some of you who've been here before can be the judge already, but, but don't judge me too hard. Uh, at any rate, um, I see no reason not to get just get started. Uh, all I wanted to say really quickly is if anyone's interested, you know, we will leave the room open afterwards if you have questions for the writers or if you have comments yourself. Um, we also will be posting links to people's work in the chat. So if you uh, just click the little chat bubble at the bottom of the Zoom window, that'll open that up. We also uh, encourage our audience to use the chat as a place to offer reactions, what they like, um, any of that stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's a great place to tune in and, and have a little bit of participation during. So without further nonsense from myself, uh, our first reader tonight is Julie Danho. Her first full-length poetry collection, Those Who Keep Arriving, won the 2018 Gerald Cable Book Award from Silverfish Review Press. Her chapbook, Six, Six Portraits, received the 2013 Slapering Hole Press Chapbook Award, and her oh my gosh, I'm stumbling already. And her poems have appeared in journals such as Pleiades, Alaska Quarterly Review, and New Ohio Review, as well as being featured on the Writer's Almanac, Poetry Daily, and Verse Daily. Julie, you should be able to unmute if you're not already, and you can take it away. Thanks so much, and thanks for having me. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so my, my first book came out um, in March, right around the start of the pandemic. Um, so, but I have to say it's been, um, I mean, it's been weird, but it's also been really amazing to be able to participate in virtual readings. And I feel like I've seen more amazing readings in the past six months than I have in, in years, just because so, so many amazing writers are accessible in this way. So. Thanks so much for, for having me. Um, so I'm gonna start with actually a poem about New York City. Um, I'm, I live in Rhode Island, but um, my sister's in, in New York and a couple of my friends. So, um, so I'm there a lot and I'm a huge dessert person. Um, and so one of my favorite things to do when I go to cities is just try and sort of eat my dessert way through the city. And um, so my sister had told me about a place to get the best chocolate chip cookie in New York City. And so this is about what happened when I, when I went. It's called the best chocolate chip cookie in New York City. In case there's a line, I show up at seven, but the man at the counter said the cookies won't be ready until 11. And by then I'll be on the train, nearly halfway back to Providence. He and the dozen people behind me are waiting. So I quickly choose a ham croissant and a blueberry muffin glittering like a hotel lobby chandelier. The shop's a dab of yellow on the block. It's only seats along the front window where I sit and look at bleary people stopped at the bodega across the street, touching apples and mangoes until they find the ones most untouched. With my first bite, the croissant comes undone 
its shawl falling to the floor. I break off the peak of the muffin and hear the sugar overfill the valleys of my back teeth. I'm trying not to think about how it must taste, the best chocolate chip cookie in New York City, how big, how warm, how it would have collapsed in my mouth, traveled my blood, made wild pinwheels of my cells. How much time have I lost hunting perfection? Once before cell phones, before the days when cars couldn't linger outside the airport doors, my plane was delayed on the runway for four hours. And my husband, before he was my husband, waited for me in his cramped Plymouth, battered from years of lake effect snow. He just waited, reading a book, turning on the car every so often to listen to the radio. When I finally arrived, he was surprised that I thought he'd be gone. He said no one asked why he was there so long or what it was he was waiting for. And um, this next poem is actually the, the, um, the last poem in the book. Um, and it's about eating something very different, which is bugs, which I have not eaten. But um, when, uh, a couple of years ago, I was listening to a scientist on NPR and she was talking about the apocalypse and how humans would survive, but not in a way that we think that people would be living underground eating bugs. So, um, so this poem is called, I Want to Eat Bugs With You Underground. The scientist on the radio said that humans will survive. And at first I was buoyed, but she only meant some of us, the ones living in tunnels, eating crickets to survive, when the rest had died from mass starvation after droughts lasted longer and seas rose faster and wars killed bigger because everyone wanted what little was left. I'd be fine with being one of the billions dead unless you were still alive. Under a down comforter or by a trash fire, I want to be where you are. You know how poorly I dig holes, how angry I get when I'm cold, how twice I've accidentally maced myself, and still you'd take me with you down into the earth, give me more than my fair share of caterpillar. Few believe we're in the middle of the end because ruin can happen as slowly as plaque blocking arteries, and only later feels as true as your hand resting on my hip, both of us quiet as roses, waiting for the bees to arrive. And so um, a lot of the poems in, thank you, uh, in, in this book are about art. And um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna read the first poem in the book, um, which was the first poem I ever wrote about art. But the cover of the book is actually, is actually another, um, there's a poem about this piece of art in the book too. And I don't know if you can see, but it's light bulbs hanging down from the ceiling with little feathers in them. And so one of the things I had really wanted when, I got the book published was to have one of the pieces on the cover. This one, this poem is about a painting that was erased, so it would not make a good cover, but it's called uh, Erased de Kooning. And it's about a piece I saw years ago at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Erased de Kooning. Robert Rauschenberg wanted to know if unmaking art could make art. This idea seems too much for me having just seen giant irises blooming out of a wall, a painted lower intestine, a woman's bust sculpted from soap. But I'm standing before his canvas, his erased de Kooning drawing, and like much art, its title tells me what to see. If you were here, how you would praise this, how we would argue over whether this was true, over what, if anything, was. Rauschenberg erased a de Kooning that de Kooning reluctantly gave him because he appreciated the idea. And it was, Rauschenberg said, all about the idea. He erased the painting in celebration, just as you, I wish I could believe, erase me. Not that I'm art or you're art, but weren't we ideas of each other? If you were here, you'd make your point. Walk away before you saw that Rauschenberg erased for a month and still there are ink spots, de Kooning's violet crayon. There are even eyes still looking. My love, Rauschenberg lied. 
the idea, yes, but how his arms must have ached afterwards. And um, the last poem I wanted to read um, is also, I, I thought it might be appropriate to begin and end with a New York City poem. Um, but this one uh, is a very different, a very different poem. Um, a couple of years ago, in times when we could go places, um, uh, my husband and my daughter and I had gone to see Matilda on Broadway and we were leaving. We were taking the subway back to my friend's apartment and my husband and my daughter got off and then the doors closed and it was it was clearly some sort of mistake because there was a ton of people behind me and nothing like that had ever happened before um and uh but this is this is what happened after that it's called the subway doors closed the subway doors closed after my husband and daughter but before me and she began screaming on the platform as the train lurched the length of a few cars, then stopped hard. The crowd surging forward, reaching over and in front of me, trying to force open the doors when shouting came from the back. Someone's fallen on the tracks, a child. I was confused. My girl had been the only child on the platform. Panic came on slow as air bubbles in the water before it boils, but it must have been just milliseconds before I turned and said, a child? And the woman yelled, that's her mother. Get her mother off this train. This woman needs off the train. All went still as they stared at me and it felt like the time I flipped over my car, hitting every side, then wasn't sure if I was dead or alive because I've been looking at my child a minute before and they're saying she's on the tracks with the rats and the electricity and the trains charging this way. Had she run toward the car when it started to move and slid over the edge? She'd had on Mary Jane's and a polka dot dress. I pressed myself against the glass, frantic as a pinned moth, its wings still beating. I tried to see down to where she'd been as the crowd murmured like a receiving line, a few people laying their hands on my back as suddenly they appeared, my husband waving, my daughter still screaming. It was a grown woman who fell, not in, but next to the tracks. She was drunk, trying to get the doors open for the rest of us. So my husband had no idea why everyone on the train was looking at the two of them, why people started hugging and congratulating me as if she'd just been born. Thanks. Wow, Julie, thank you so much. Uh, this is, I had so many thoughts during all of that, but that last one really sort of got is like so suspenseful and and tense. Um, it was that was that was one. I I think that was one of the crazier moments of my of my life. Was those mm. those like two minutes? I I can imagine. I mean, so people <laughs> suddenly deciding to try to try to make you think that your daughter's hurt in some way when you've just been separated. Yeah, um, I had uh, it's just working backwards. Uh, the the poem about uh living undergrad and eating bugs was really one of the more uh surprisingly sweet things I've ever heard it was really I think there was a line in there about about someone that you'd be willing to share your caterpillar with and there was just something about the idea of like a couple sitting there together and you know cutting this little inch long caterpillar in half um that was really beautiful but really the one that stuck with me the most honestly to some extent was the first one because I, i've lived in new york for a long time and every um as i'm sure you know if you know people who live in new york city or any big city you will get these sudden i read in a magazine the best xyz in the entire world is at this place you got to go there and it's really interesting because almost that anticipation is kind of better than whatever it ends up being there, there is it's it hurts like it's not comfortable to sort of <laughs> long for something but it's like you will go there and it will be a cookie a pizza a park well you know whatever it was that they were saying mm -hmm. is the best thing ever and it really it's it's bigger than just the idea of new york because i think 
well it gets to the you ending it with instead you know your husband picking you up at the airport and having to wait right is is it's this um what we think will happen is never what will happen but there is like a pleasure in the expectation and the hope for something so uh i really i just that resonated with me because i'm thinking of one friend in particular who i'm sure trina knows who i mean instantly who constantly texts me things being like oh, you gotta go here there's the best falafel in town or whatever <laughs> And it's always just falafel. But uh, if I could get access to that mind frame, that hope, that's really the important thing. And honestly, the reason the poem worked for me is that's found way more frequently in human relationships than in relationships with cookies. So anyway, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I see Noli just uh, posted links. So there's links to your website uh, to buy the book and also your Twitter um, over in the chat. And, uh, you know, well, I just wanted to say we've had a lot of people um, over this year, obviously, whose book launches or, or uh, publications have been disrupted because of coronavirus. And I'm really glad you've been able to find some places to, to share and read. And honestly, like, the great thing for us is geography matters a little less right now. Like, yeah, we're- I know, we're it's, it's a really up, wonderful but... thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, we do live in New York. We love Providence too. Just <laughs> Providence is great. Yeah. So anyway, one day when the world is all whatever it is again, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you if we're ever in Providence eating Indian food again. Where did you go? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's on whatever the main street is. I can't remember what it was. Anyway, we can talk about it afterwards, but Thank you so much for sharing. I got off on a tangent and uh, we, should, we should move on. But thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Doing great. Uh, I am slightly distractible this evening, I'm finding. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to stay here. Anyway, uh, our next reader is Elizabeth Bales Frank. She is the author of the historical novel Censorettes, Stonehouse Publishing, November 2020. Oh, so freshly out. Her previous novel was Cougar Cutlass, published by Harper and Row. Her essays have appeared in Glamour, Cosmopolitan, The Sun, Barrel House, Post Road, Epiphany, The Writing Disorder, and other literary publications. She was awarded a residency at Ragdale. Frank earned a BFA in film from New York University and an MLIS from the Pratt Institute. She lives in New York City, and her website is elizafrank.com. Elizabeth, you should be able to unmute and take it away. Try that. Hi, everyone. Be good. Um, thanks so much for having me. Thank you, great indoor reading series and Noli, and thank you everyone who's attended. Here's a, f a photo of my book, <laughs> actually the actual book, um, which yeah, just came out uh, three weeks ago. So I'm gonna read from the beginning. Lucy Barrett did not intend to spend the war in paradise. After her mother was killed in the Blitz, her father sent Lucy out of England, all the way to Bermuda, deaf to her pleas that there was no place of safety in this ever-growing war. But Bermuda seemed determined to prove her wrong, this cosseted island of keen colors, coral beaches, sunsets, pastel-painted limestone houses, bearing up rain-scrubbed white roofs. Lucy walked under a placid sky unburdened by barrage balloons, bomber planes, or even the soot of industry or the exhaust of motor cars. The morning dew breezed away the brine as though the air, like Lucy, relied on a restorative wash to cleanse bad dreams and brave the new day. She departed from the resort hotel where the censorettes were lodged, the Bermudiana, and walked a lonely slope with her roommate, Rebecca Lark, to the resort hotel where they worked the Princess Hotel. Hamilton was the only city on the island and the princess, named for Louise, a daughter of Queen Victoria, had popularized Bermuda as a vacation spot when it had until then not been known for much except pirates and onions, smuggling and shipbuilding. Now it was clip-clopped by one horse carriages called Gary's or traversed by bicycles bearing pleasant clerks to their offices in downtown Hamilton. Good morning, good day. Lucy's task as a member of the Imperial Censorship Detachment was to read letters in the reading room, a basement in the Princess Hotel. She had arrived in gray January. It was now March. 
Among the hundreds of letters she had read, she remembered only one clearly, written by a Joe in Brooklyn to an address in Bremerhaven, Germany. It had made an obscure reference to Shakespeare. This March morning, Lucy read another letter from Joe. She pulled her blouse collar away from her sticky neck and reread the letter. The store caught fire and burned down, but fortunately most of the goods were still in the warehouse in Red Hook. The waiting is hard, but we must have the patience. The days are long and full of wonder, but remember the words of Romeo, do nothing until you hear from me. Sincerely, Joe. Another reference to Shakespeare, but this second letter was pocked with tiny bumps. Lucy traced her fingers along the bumps. Was it Braille? Did it mean something? Did any of her work with the detachment mean anything? The men of the detachment boarded the ocean liners traveling between warring Europe and the neutral United States. They knocked down cabin walls, ripped open luggage and seized contraband, funds, bonds, stolen artwork. They interrogated, threatened. They clapped potential saboteurs in handcuffs and hauled them into custody. The men of the detachment did not read letters in a basement. She raised the letter to her reading lamp to study its indentations. It bowed toward her like a weak wave cresting. But remember the words of Romeo, do nothing until you hear from me. Someone's words may hap, Lucy thought, but not poor Romeo's. In Brooklyn Joe's first letter, he had referred to Shakespeare as the swan of Avon rather than the bard of Avon. Although no one asked her to, Lucy had investigated the swan reference. It was a mystery she could try to solve, unlike the question of why her father had decided that this remote colonial outpost was the best use of the skills she had acquired after years of rigorous schooling. Swan of Avon, Romeo, warehouse. On her Saturday half days, she bicycled through the narrow lanes of Bermuda, past palmetto trees and hibiscus shrubs. First, she stopped at the Bermuda Library, a grand name for a large cottage with a small yard enclosed by a stone wall. The full-time librarian had devoted a fruitless hour to the Swan of Avon question before suggesting that Lucy interview the island's school teachers. Each teacher met her with civility, services of tea, and no insight beyond a suggestion of another resource. They sketched rough maps to guide her to her next de destination until Lucy knew the parishes of the fishhook-shaped islands better than the back of her hand. The back of her hand, actually, had tanned into a stranger's, despite the many pairs of white gloves Granny Barrett packed for her when it became manifest that Lucy could not escape her exile to Bermuda. Lucy peddled the island unenlightened, unimpressed, Bermuda's greatest casualty of war was the absence of tourists enjoying her slim beaches, rolling golf courses, and discreet hotels. Finally, Lucy returned to the Bermuda Library on the last Saturday of the month when, the librarian had told her, the cataloger, Clara, came in to log the collection's new arrivals. Excuse me, Lucy had said to the back of a head of curls bent over a book, the constellations as seen from the North Atlantic. I'm told you might know, has Shakespeare ever been described as the Swan of Avon? Funny you should ask. Clara was the first to find it amusing. Her curls framed a tawny face. Ben Jonson called Shakespeare the Sweet Swan of Avon in a eulogy published in the first folio. There's a bit about the constellations later on in the eulogy. She gestured at her book. Why Swan? The question had nothing to do with the case, but it seemed ages since anyone had taken Lucy seriously. The Greeks believed that the souls of poets set up house in swans after they died. You sound like you're from London. Have you ever seen one? A, a Greek? A first folio, Clara said. They have a few at the British Library. I used to dream of getting a job there. Small chance of it now, though. Yes, so the first folio? I suppose they're quite valuable. The last ones went for seven to 10,000 American dollars. I was at Smith at the time. Smith College, she explained in response to Lucy's inquiring look, one of the seven sisters. Seven sisters. Lucy glanced at Clara's book. Constellations. The Pleiades? No, it's a nickname, Clara smiled, for a group of women's colleges in the States. Anyhow, the first folio, only a hundred odd copies still around. 
Fewer still if the Luftwaffe hit the British Library. Was Brooklyn Joe a rare book dealer flogging a first folio to raise funds for the Nazis? Valuables were smuggled out of Europe all the time. The August before Lucy arrived in Hamilton, men from the detachment had found a small art gallery behind a panel in a stateroom on the SS Excalibur of the American export line. Canvases by Renoir, Cezanne, and Manet, confiscated by the Nazis from Jewish owners, headed to New York for sale. Paintings were solid proof. Swan of Avon was an errant phrase. When Lucy brought the first letter into her supervisor, Colonel Mackay, he had dismissed it. But now she had a second letter, and it had bumps. I'm just going to skip to her taking the letter into her supervisor, which is here. Mackay was sipping tea and reading her personnel file when Lucy entered his office. I remember now, Mackay drained his tea and nibbled a biscuit, our Brooklyn Shakespeare scholar. Warehouse, is that what troubles you? He wiped crumbs from his chin. Do nothing until you hear from me, Lucy said. That troubles me. It's not the ordinary sort of wrong, like wherefore art thou Romeo? Everyone thinks it means where is Romeo instead of why are you Romeo? Wherefore, like the French pourquoi or the Italian perché? Anyway, Lucy added, as Mackay's attention had drifted toward her uneaten biscuit, Romeo never says that. You've memorized the play? Mackay reached for Lucy's biscuit. My family performed Shakespeare often after dinner. I see. How nice. Lucy might have been a small granddaughter displaying a grubbery embroidery project. In her father's study, there were often as many as a dozen copies of one play, so each player could hold a volume. Chuckling dinner guests lured into the study with the promise of brandy were pressed into service. No, no, Barrett, I'm rubbish at this sort of thing only to become so caught up in the drama that their shouting roused the dozing cats. My mother wished to improve her English. Ah, yes, he glanced at her file. Your mother's an Italian. Yes, she was. It still happened, that clogged throat that prefaced her correction of the verb tense, the tight twist in her gut like a contraction. Well, what was a contraction but the indication of loss, an apostrophe where her letter had been won't for will not, as in we won't ever see her again. Maria Teresa Geldini Barrett, Tessa. Lucy's eyes filled. She blinked rapidly, but a tear fell to her chin before she could stop it. She was killed in a Luftwaffe bombing. Yes, frightful business. Mackay failed to indicate whether it was Tessa's death or the blitz, which was frightful. Your degree, he went on, French, German, but not Italian. I'm cradle fluent in Italian. Lucy dabbed her eyes with her wrists, claimed her cup of tea. My father chose German. In German, you decline nouns, adjectives. Learning to decline would teach me to decline men, he said, his favorite joke. Never had daughters. Mackay rubbed his hands together as though cleansing them of the threat of female offspring. And I'll stop there. All right, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, just, just such a cool um interesting and rich historical setting you know I, I the the whole um the whole business of like secrecy and wartime before you know now before what back when we didn't live in like a panopticon kind of and like everyone knew everything it's, it's it's so interesting and i love this you know this idea of this this young woman really trying very hard both to have done a good job and find something but it's also you know sort of really trying to find extra meaning in this sort of meaningless work um and you know your 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 writing just has such wonderful turns of phrases and observations and things in it it really really rich um is it i, I i've always wondered uh i don't know if we've had anyone who's written a historical novel before did this involve like an awful lot of research oh yes mm. You, you mentioned in my biography, MLIS, and that mm -hmm. is during the research. Okay. Because <laughs> I wrote to so many archivists and historians and librarians at Girton College where Lucy graduated from and um, the Naval Academy to find out where her boyfriend, would have, what he would have studied and mm. um, even the Bermuda Library, which photocopied many copies of their, their newspaper during the time. Mm. I could see 
there's a scene where they they're looking at the paper to see what movie to go see um mm. and it, it, it's all historically accurate that's amazing that's that's such such an interesting um I don't know. It just it's such an interesting way of going about things both creatively and and sort of research wise at the same time, kind of crafting this uh, believable and realistic and honestly not realistic real world <laughs> that this person that you can then, you know, has their own story in it. So that's that's wonderful. So yeah, uh, so I think, uh, yep, I believe, so you can just get the book on bookshop.org, which is our favorite uh, site. I don't know if there's a there's a more specific link. The book is uh, Censorettes, and uh, you can catch up with, do you go by Eliza? I don't, but everyone okay. else had taken Elizabeth Frank, and somebody else had taken Elizabeth Frank, and she had the nerve to win the Pulitzer. Oh. Oh, so that's why I'm Elizabeth Bales Frank. Gotcha. Because I didn't That's, want to go through life with that disclaimer. That, no, yeah. not the Pulitzer, the other one. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, awards or no, wonderful reading. <laughs> and uh, I actually would really love to find out the rest of this story. So I uh, look forward to reading the book. Thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing it with us. Thanks for having me. Of course. And it's good to get more Queens content yeah. in here. Yeah, we're probably <laughs> like, we're honestly probably two miles from you right now, which is kind of fun, but. Anyway, we can talk about that later on. Thank okay. Again. All right. So our next reader, oh, I should say without any more falderall for myself, our next reader is Catherine Coldiron. She is the author of Ceremonials, an SPD bestseller. Her work as a book critic has appeared in the Washington Post, The Believer, The Guardian, and many other places. She lives in California and at kcoldiron.com. Catherine, you should be able to unmute and proceed. Maybe. Okay, this is me proceeding. There we go. Um, congratulations on pronouncing my name correctly. I know that I shouldn't, that sounds condescending, but honestly, like the guy at, at um, Bromans just didn't say my last name at all. So um, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And thank you, Noli, and thank you, TGI, and thank you, Trina. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this is my book, Ceremonials, also a big poster in the background. Um, I'm a little tired of reading from this book because it's short. And so I've read almost everything that I can read from it. Um, so I'm going to read something else. And I picked something kind of strange. Um, Marissa Siegel at The Rumpus asked me to write one of their Letters in the Mail series. If you don't know about that, it's... Um, where you sign up for these letters in the mail and they ask writers to write these letters and then they're physically sent to you. Um, and the timeline is funky. So she said, you can't say anything about current events because it's probably gonna be stale by the time we send out the letter. Um, and this was like shortly after the pandemic started, I think. So I had to figure out a way to write about what was going on in my life without <laughs> writing about the pandemic. Um, and I was really glad that I didn't because um, the BLM protests exploded like the next month. And I thought, oh my God, what if I wrote a letter and it didn't have that anyway? Um, because this reading series is occupied by so many writers, I thought that this letter would be useful and interesting. Um, and especially since probably not very many of you subscribe to letters in the mail, you wouldn't have gotten this. Dearest friends, as I write this, I'm square in the middle of binging the Star Trek series Voyager. I've watched The Next Generation many, many times, and this is my first foray off the Enterprise. It's acting on me in curious ways. I find myself with excess emotions I can't seem to burn off, where usually when I'm involved in a show, it's my brain that won't stop working on it. A lot of the characters in Voyager make mistakes, and the consequences ripple on into the future of the future in realistic, fascinating ways. Last year, I watched The Wire, which acted on me more cerebrally, and I came up with a hypothesis. Mistakes are like putting nitrous oxide into your narrative gas tank. Kaboom. When a character makes a mistake, the world around her has to rejigger. Other characters have to adjust. Consequences appear in waves across time and space. Friendships end stupidly over mistakes. Murderers are only caught because they make mistakes. Kingdoms are won and lost for them. 
I read and reviewed a book recently where the author was clearly putting her characters through a series of required actions as if they were puppets, rather than letting them move beyond the boundaries of their little stage. I yearned for at least one of them to make a mistake, something serious, maybe unrecoverable. I wanted the author to write a character into a corner instead of pushing her along a straight line. Alas, the author has bestseller status to maintain, so the characters kept dancing on her strings, lessening their exposure to risk, walking back rash decisions. It wasn't a fun book to read. It offered a series of low, unimpressive narrative obstacles. Hoops successfully jumped through, their fires extinguished. Other books are premised on mistakes. In Rebecca, the second Mrs. De Winter makes absolute bucketfuls of mistakes. And so does Maxim, who has amazingly poor intuition about the women he marries. Moby Dick, of all books, maybe Ishmael should not have joined the crew of the Pequod in the first place. Elena Ferrante's work is shot through with characters who make terrible errors. No life is free of mistakes and no good novel ought to be either. What I'm saying isn't new. Aristotle called this idea hamartia, tragic error. Hamartia was interpreted across literary history as an innate deep set flaw, but modern scholarship has argued it's more of an on the fly mistake rather than a prominent character trait that clashes just right with the surrounding plot circumstances. Hamlet, not Antigone. Hamlet makes a pile of errors based on bad judgment and emotional unrest, while the characterization in Antigone, those traits set against each other makes murder a foregone conclusion. One of the other threads running through Voyager is failure. I broke down in helpless tears when in The Last Jedi, Yoda pointed out that failure is one of our greatest teachers. It certainly has proven so for me. Only through failure have I learned to value success. It's rare and hard to write about failure though, or to make syndicated television about it. So many more possibilities. Failure and mistakes are fractalizing elements of a narrative work, causing more complications per capita than any other kind of plot choice which means you as a writer must have the requisite imagination and the requisite measure of authorial control to determine what's going to happen to your sad little fellow in the center of the storm. Maybe he just can't overcome his flaws and failures. Maybe some weirdo loves him because of his flaws and this causes him to indulge his worst self. Maybe after many years of failure, he assembles a decent existence out of scotch tape and balsa wood, one that can't withstand a particularly heavy rainstorm and then a typhoon comes to town. I want to see more characters failing and making mistakes only to fix them or work around them and keep going. On Voyager, they have no other choice because they're trapped alone together in an unfamiliar section of space facing 70 years of travel before they get back to their, our solar system. That means they repair themselves again and again, reinvent themselves over and over. They don't act perfectly or predictably. They act like human beings, which means they screw up and then they have to face the embarrassment of having screwed up in front of the same 150 people as ever and wake up the next day and make amends and move on. What does that do to a character? I look at her and I see all the mistakes she's ever made along with all the love she's given out and all the integrity she represents. I see a person with a full history, someone who does her best, which is just not always enough. If she makes no mistakes at all, I'll see a lifeless paper doll, a puppet who will never create meaning in my life. I'll forget her and I won't recommend her story to anyone else. How can we shore ourselves up if we don't overcome failure and remember the crystal sharp sensation of that perseverance when we feel helpless? And how can com characters compel us unless they have to do the same? Before I married my husband, I didn't understand the continuity of family. Mistakes are difficult to move beyond in my family. My father still holds a grudge against me for events from 1998. My husband's family is more demonstrative and impulsive, which means they often say silly or rude things. And then we have to apologize to each other and get beyond it. Well into my adult life, I had to learn how to forgive and forget instead of sort of forgiving and never forgetting. Family is close knit and permanent for him in a way it wasn't for me. And that means that there are dips and bumps in our relationships with each other instead of the pacific uniformity that emotional distance achieves. It all has a cohesion an unspoken unbrokenness that was hard for me to comprehend and adhere to. The same thing goes on in Voyager. The residents of that ship have to be a family since they're all together day after day for seven damn decades, which is a human lifespan. 
they have to forgive and forget in ways that most crews don't, since members of other crews can just request transfers and be gone in a few weeks. There's a permanence there, a continuity that builds a strong and reasonable foundation for these motifs of failure and error. It's a pretty remarkable set of choices for TV writers to make in the mid 1990s. I dare you to make those choices too. Let your characters screw up recklessly and look around at the wreckage with no idea how to fix it. Write your main squeeze into a corner and make her do something unforgivable. See where that engine takes you with love and failure. Thank you. All right, Catherine, thank you so much. That was awesome. I, I don't, I, I, I would love to be more articulate, but that's the first word that comes to mind is just this. Uh, it says so many things that I, uh, I think need to hear both as a creative person, but also just as a person, um, you know, reminders. And I think, uh, well, first of all, it's interesting just that it all came from Voyager, which I think is, is really fun, but also it's, it's, you know, uh, it points to something interesting, which is that science fiction or uh, speculative fiction, et cetera, when it's at its best, actually says something about the people who are reading or watching it. It doesn't really say anything about aliens and space and all this stuff. Um, and I think it's such an interesting point of view to take because I could feel inside myself um, this old belief, this sort of like sourceless, vague belief that no, when you write something, when you make something, you need to know, you need to know how it's going to end up first. And that's where you're sort of walking towards, right? And if you're doing that, then you end up with characters that have to make these really simplistic linear decisions you can't actually have the freedom of humanity and the, the range of behaviors that like people might have. Yeah. And also there's no surprise in it for you, the person who's working on it. Exactly. So I, I, it's Sorry. kind of boring. No, 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 please. Um, and I think that's, that's such a more interesting perspective to take of like sitting down with a character and being like, wait, why'd they do that? The hell that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah so this is is this something you've sort of uh obviously you've learned from watching or reading other things but is this something you found in your own sort of process of creating things no okay. not yet not yet <laughs> um uh there's there's a novel on my horizon that i will probably like, I know that my main character um, is going to make one major mistake, um, but I don't, I don't know what else she's going to do, but I am going to make her fuck up a lot. Um, mm -hmm. The thing that, that I was thinking about um, was how the Coen brothers um, do their screenplays is they deliberately write themselves into a corner and then they have to figure out a way mm -hmm. out of it. And to me, that's mm -hmm. a much more interesting way of doing story. I mean, you have to be really, really good to do that. Um, I think if you, if you are not up to the challenge, then you'll just write yourself new, into a corner. Um, but if you can get into something that seems absolutely unresolvable and then get out of it, that's going to be more satisfying for the audience than something that's, you know, just do, 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 putting my paper dolls through their paces. Like, no, that's a dumb way to write. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I think also that um, just to shift it back to like the real humanity part, you know, the, the bit you mentioned about your family versus your husband's family. Like, yeah. You know, I think many of us, especially many of us who end up being, I guess, for lack of a better term, more intellectually focused, um, maybe come from families where mistakes and uh, errors and all these things are kind of maybe not unforgivable, but they're like unmentionable in some way. Yeah. And I think part of the creative process is also getting comfortable with the fact that not only will the characters, words, whatever, not do exactly what you think they're gonna do. For me, at least it's been coming to terms with the fact that I will never be able to walk out with it finished and be like, this is it, it's done here. <laughs> And yep. there's some part of me, some very old part of me, so I suspect it has something to do with judgmental family members that uh, that thinks that if it if I'm not able to do that, I probably should just not do it. 
you know, and I get, I get kind of like avoidant and, and I do this with my hands, like, like Wallace from Wallace and Gromit. And um, I kind of, you know, panic. And I think it's so important to just reinforce, like, no matter what the norms were in your family, in your education, no matter what that one unreasonable professor said, what an editor says, what an agent says, rejection letters, etc. It doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. You're just doing human stuff. Yes. Um, I think failure is something it's especially if you come from a demanding family but also if you're just a perfectionist um it seems like failure is not uh uh desirable but i think it's kind of the only way to grow and that sounds like lip service but it's also it's it's actually a deep truth i think Mm -hmm. i have lots more to say but i don't want to hog the time (laughs) we no, we could talk about this much more uh and and i would love to do so and i also just uh, i identify heavily with the character you mentioned who has uh uh scotch taped together his life out of balsa wood that's pretty much me uh right now so (laughs) anyway thank you so much this was great you've been you know you've come the past few weeks and it was great to finally hear from you so thank you very much Thank thank you all right All right, folks, we have one more reader tonight, uh, and that last reader is Ashley Wells. Ashley Wells is a writer living in Logan, Utah. She teaches in the English department at Utah State University. Prior to that, she taught courses on the rhetoric of freedom in cowgirl narratives at the University of Iowa. Instantly fascinating. Her work exploring cowgirl narratives has appeared in Bitch Magazine, Connotation Press, and Jezebel. Wells earned her Master of Fine Arts degree in... in creative writing nonfiction from California State University, Fresno, where she worked as an editorial assistant at the Normal School Magazine. Ashley, you should be able to unmute yourself. There Hi, you thank you so much. Yeah, is, is the volume okay for this? Okay, great. I really appreciate this space. Um, my book, The Cowgirl and the Racehorse, came out uh, last month, so it's really just great to share it with folks. Um, including one of my first cowgirl stories students who is zooming in from China, which is amazing. So thank you, Grace, (laughs) for that. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the second chapter. Uh, So all you'll really need to know about that is um, I had a traumatic horseback riding accident. um, And this comes after, and it also comes after I got my horse treasure, who is a retired racehorse, who was very neglected. Um, And it kind of starts with him. Shoshona is my childhood horse that I reference. Um, I had her through adulthood and she was, I was obsessed with her. So that'll sort of frame it. (laughs) Treasure stomped impatiently as the craniosacral therapist, Shay, gently worked her fingers all over his head. Everything was silent. It was still early, so it was just just the three of us in Treasure's stall amid the gray of morning. Despite the chill that numbed my fingers, shades were nimble and precise, finding the exact spots where the bone and muscle compressions needed to be released, lingering evidence of Treasure's former life as a racehorse. Slowly, we would erase all traces of an existence that was filled with stress and scarcity. Slowly, starting with his bones and his guts, we would convince Treasure that he was a new horse, a different horse. Treasure fought Shay's hold at first. He was unsure of the change in energy and twisted his great long neck out of her hands, lifting his head high above her own, far beyond her reach. Shay quietly persisted and he relaxed into it, settling into the gentle charge of her work, into the relief. Treasure's eyes began to droop as he lazily licked and chewed, emitting soft coos with each breath. She called it the perfect bone, the maxilla, she said, slowly drawing the syllables out, graceful and lilting. I had seen the skull of a horse, but I had never stopped to consider which bone might be the best of them all. However, I believe Shay unwaveringly because the way she touched Treasure's face so tenderly, so intimately, moving ever so slightly the bones beneath the skin was sincere. She touched him in a way that I know he had never been touched at the track. 
I couldn't help but think of my own bones as Shay said this. I am nearly always thinking about my own bones. While the compression fracture in my spine was filled with cement years ago, my vertebrae still feel shoddy with the constant aches and creaks, reminders of the imperfection beneath my skin. In the years following my surgery, my back has become less and less my own, each time a different set of hands danced across it and someone says, oh yes, here, stopping where the muscle shivered under their fingers. The chronic pain acts as a steadfast reminder of the very literal risk of very real injuries and fatalities involved in riding horses, but also of the symbolic and complicated relationship between risk and identity, inspiring contemplation of why I am so compelled to continue riding despite the ever-present fear and serious danger. Ultimately though, my fall revealed a truth that I had been blind to in my more than 20 years of riding. We must shift our way of relating to horses, to all animals. Grappling with this, I've come closer to understanding why so many of the horsewomen I know have had serious accidents and still continue to ride. Why I am willing in adulthood to wholeheartedly embrace this lifestyle and identity. Why the back of a horse feels like home to me. I haven't always had the vocabulary or insight to understand horsemanship as I do now. I didn't always understand the significant ways that it studied me through adolescence and shaped my personality into adulthood, influencing the trajectory of my life. I haven't always been so sure. When I was 17, I wandered far from home, but Shoshona kept me tethered. She kept me from becoming so hopelessly lost from drifting so far away that I might not return, although I came close. Perhaps this is why I am now so apt to allow my identity as a horsewoman to bleed into my life outside of the arena, why it is so wholly unavoidable that I do. David played in a popular local punk band and we met through mutual friends. He was a few years older and possessed a swagger and confidence that the boys at my high school seemed to lack. The first night he called me, we spoke on the phone for hours, long after my parents and brothers had gone to sleep. The house stood silent except for the faint whispers coming from my room. The next morning I woke up blurry eyed and exhausted, telling my mother I was sick and would need to miss school that day. At lunchtime, I called my best friend at school and re excitedly recounted the night before. During one of our late night phone conversations a few weeks later, David said he needed to tell me something. He told me that he loved me, surprised and sure that I didn't love him back, that I didn't even know how to articulate feelings like that. I told him I wasn't ready. This set him off and he cried into the phone. He told me that he couldn't be with me unless I said it back, that I had to say it back. It being my first relationship, I had nothing to compare it to, but this still seemed wrong. I felt trapped. Having never been faced with such dramatic emotions, I said the words back in hopes that it would ease him down and buy me some time to figure things out. It worked and we went back to the lighthearted and youthful way we had been before. I still don't understand why I didn't simply end it there. Growing up, I had extinguished minor crushes for far less. I don't understand what had changed. To this day, I'm disgusted even thinking about it. That year, I quit student government despite having been junior class president the year before. I ditched school with my friends to drive around town smoking cigarettes and haunting thrift stores. We spent our nights in dingy halls watching local punk bands thrash and scream on stage. But I never abandoned Shoshona. I spent my late afternoons with her, brushing her coat, cleaning her feet, absorbing the peace of her sturdy body and of the ranch. I lived a split life as I found myself increasingly immersed in the punk scene, exposed to the bravado and violence the brand of loyalty and respect that made me, the girlfriend of a key player, untouchable. 
At 17, I didn't know how to deal with this sense of power. I didn't recognize the silliness or the danger in our feigning adulthood, in feigning toughness. During those years, the sense of vulnerability I'd experienced simply existing in the world as a young girl seemed to evaporate. I moved freely, I spoke freely. If anyone insulted or disrespected me, an apology quickly followed once they realized who I was dating. Holding such sway over adult men was completely foreign. Once at a party as I stood outside talking and drinking with my friends, a drunk man stumbled into me. His bleary red eyes made contact with mine and hatefully he spat out the word slut. I was stunned. Before I could react, one of David's friends intercepted and grabbed the guy by the shoulder. You don't know who you're talking to, he told the man. You need to apologize. The drunk man was furious, but he mumbled an apology before stomping out of the yard. Prior to dating David, I had never witnessed men apologize for calling a young woman a slut, for hissing disgusting words about her body, for acting as though she was less than. I now know that the vulnerability never disappeared. It was just misplaced. People were afraid of my boyfriend and his friends. I didn't realize that my age and fear of returning to that sense of powerlessness experienced by young women made it easy for David to take advantage of me. He recognized my fear and used it to bully me like he bullied others. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much um, really, so much to think about there. I gotta say, you know, you said uh, about that phone call with this guy, you said you still experienced disgust years later. And I, I, I'm not disgusted by you at all, but when you were, when you were saying it, I was kind of like, Ooh, I had like a physical sensation of discomfort <laughs> in that situation. And also this sort of like, I guess it, it's, it's fascinating in a way because when we're younger, I would really think that, you know, someone was maybe being maybe dramatic maybe that's it i don't know but now it's sort of like oh that's manipulative and kind of abusive and creepy like and and i think um using that example like you didn't have to tell us a whole lot more about that relationship for me to kind of understand i mean starting with the fact that he was a few years older than you and he's you know in this scene and stuff but but also that and i think there's a really interesting um juxtaposition between the sort of stereotypes and this is maybe this is just me but i feel like there are stereotypes to some extent about young women who are into horses it is like a type in a way it's something we, we we might have preconceived notions about like i have female friends who who grew up with horses and they have a certain you know um i, I don't want to say innocence but we almost associate it with a sort of innocence in a way right yeah, so, it's super. It's so interesting. It uh, absolutely the horse girl trope is. Like, mm. It's treated with such. Um, I know it's treated as sort of soft and fuzzy, and mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. There's a, a an anthology coming out with um, like really great writers, Ali Robottom and Takira Madden, writing about the horse girl trope. So mm -hmm. I am. Like beyond excited because it's such a fascinating thing that um like endures hmm. it, it, yeah, it's like it's ever it, it never changes <laughs> yeah and it, it's funny because it does almost harken back to like uh, you know it almost is like you can't imagine even the you know I'm sure there's there's there are young women who are horse enthusiasts right now but for some reason i still view their life as being like black beauty or something in my head and i just i've never second guessed that i guess like i've never taken the time to that's one stereotype that i've never really taken the time to deconstruct and think about and it, what's interesting is two things one is obviously what you mentioned in 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 your essay about the risk the physical risk involved um, as well as the um, the work that's involved in in taking care of and and you know you mentioned it with the rehabilitation of a horse and that actually uh, you know I I sort of really I think is an interesting place to start too because 
when you said um, um, there was something in there where you mentioned that the goal was to basically do all these things for this horse to convince him that he was a different horse. And my gut response was, isn't that what everybody wants? Like, isn't it, if we just, if we could go and we could be cared for in a way that will make us feel like a completely new person, mm -hmm. not just a recovered person from whatever we've gone through, but like new. <laughs> um, so I think the, you know, the juxtaposition there of, of, I'm assuming, I'm sure you go into it more in the book, but there, the, the rescue horse and the, you know, your own maybe wayward youth year, um, and then coming back and then also your recovery from this injury um so it uh, i had an end to this sentence but then the more i think about it the more perfectly related everything was <laughs> as i'm sure was intended by you <laughs> but um but yeah it just it really all hangs together really well and i think um so this 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 book is uh is it mainly uh sort of it's essays but is it mainly in the uh, a memoir-ish form Okay. It is. Yeah. And it's actually getting into, um, you know, of course, all of the things you mentioned, like the, the cowgirl narratives and how they, um, like there is actually a kernel of truth to a lot of them. And like, hmm. there's this weird overlap, but then of course there's the reality that um, I sort of discover coming to horsemanship again with treasure. There's a lot of cruelty and horses are the most abused animal domesticated hmm. animals. Like, and anything goes really. Um, so I sort of explore that with treasure and Braden, you know, the, the personal narrative alongside it. Um, and what, what they offer women um, in terms of like abusive relationships, like mm -hmm. with um, David and, and other kinds of things like that, the power they can offer you. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, the more kind of getting into all of, all of that murky business. Well, that sounds wonderful. And, you know, it's funny because last week, actually, um, I think it was last week after the show, we had a long talk about horses because Catherine, who read before you, works with horses. And we were also talking about um, uh, equine therapy and, and all mm, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And, and this all brings up, you know, I was shocked. We watched a, a, a PBS Nature about the relationship between people and horses and the level of social intelligence in horses baffled me. I had no idea. So, I can see how, especially if you have maybe had a difficult social relationship in the past, you're earning a horse's trust, it's earning your trust, and it works both ways. It's like an actual full relationship. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to, uh, well, people should buy the book. That's <laughs> actually where I should end. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, there's a link to the book in the chat and, uh, you know, uh, I encourage also the right the, the readers to scroll up in the chat and take a look at, at the comments. Uh, I can assure you now, none of them were unkind. Uh, they were very kind. And um, with that, uh, that brings us to a close for this week. Uh, roughly on time, I might add. Well done, everyone. Um, briefly, uh, Catherine, you did not blab too much. You're doing great. Um, <laughs> briefly, uh, just a quick bit of business about the show. Uh, you can find us most easily at TGICast.com or on Twitter at TGICast. You can uh, catch up with Trina, the founder of the show, on Twitter at Trina Tibbs, T-R-E-E-N-A-T-H-I-B-S. Uh, our show's booker and arguably the most important person in the actual organization of the show, Noli Reed, can be found on Twitter at Noli Reed. And you can find myself on Twitter, should you choose to. I don't really use it very much, at Ridge Cresswell. And lately, the past four days, you can find me on Instagram posting only pictures of birds at Birdvert. I just think the name's clever. So anyways, uh, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much to the uh, readers and, uh, and you know, sharers of their work. Um, I always am impressed by the quality and variety of people that we get for the show and also the vulnerability that people are willing to display in reading work that is very often reflecting on their own personal histories or circumstances. Uh, it's really inspiring. So thank you. And uh, with that, uh, as I said before, if anyone wants to hang around, ask questions, find out where to get books, things like that, please do so. But I will stop the recording. Boop. <laughs>